Hey guys, how's it going? My name is Chad Kanyer. I'm here with uh, my friend Bryce Petty. I'm excited to kick this off. We're just going to talk about his journey from uh, his college days all the way up through the NFL, and we're going to talk about what he's doing now. So I'm really excited to have him on as a guest. It's been cool getting to know him and his family. Um, so let's just get into it, man. Let's rock and roll. Let's rock and roll. So where are you from? Midlothian, Texas. All right, so for people uneducated about the geography of Texas. Of Tejas, yeah. It's about uh, 35 minutes south of Dallas. Okay, cool. So you consider yourself a Dallas native? Which is I would say that, yeah. Okay. okay, cool. So we assume football standout from when you were pretty young? Um, I, I, nah, I, would, I wouldn't venture to say football standout by any means. I would just say the, the just bigger kid. Standout. Yeah, bigger kid on the block that needed uh, an outlet. Um, and uh, after about the fourth vase or painting that I broke, mom's like, you got to get in football. And, and uh, yes, yeah, so I started playing football. And then actually um, dad was coaching me first through sixth grade until I got into to junior high. And then, um, yeah, just always, always had a love for it. Really did. Uh, I was kind of a football, baseball guy growing up. And then, um, I don't know, there was just something about football that I was always a little bit more drawn to. Were you always a quarterback? Uh, always a quarterback, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Never had to hit anybody? Well, I actually, in, uh, I believe it was probably sixth grade, I think, we won first place, and uh, I was probably the only person in the league that was quarterback and then D-line. Because <laughs> so you had the size. Because yeah. you had the size. Go from, That's yeah, crazy. under center yeah. to over the it's center. One of those things at a high school level, like, you're, they're going to use your athleticism, yeah. right? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so cool. So uh, tell me about the Baylor transition and how you chose Baylor. Yeah, uh, so I was actually originally committed to Tennessee out of high school. Tennessee? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, Was you know, that like your target school? Well, what? you know, so depending on which day you find me, I, typically I'll say that, you know, I grew up in Dallas. But first and ninth grade, I grew up in Cabot, Arkansas. And so, um, you know, you grew up kind of watching the Hogs and then our – I mean, family, my dad's family um, was from Alexandria, Louisiana, and then mom's family was from Baton Rouge. And so we were always LSU fans at the same time. So, um, you know, we were just kind of SEC people at heart. And so that's, that's the, you know, when most people, and it's, and it's funny too, you know, when you, when you get around here, all the, the kids just grew up either watching Texas or OU or, you know, it's a Big 12 kind of place. And then, you know, that's what we did was watch SEC football. So that's, so that's kind of all I knew. But, um, yeah, so, you know, in, in high school, uh, moved here my, I guess my, Second semester of my freshman year, and then kind of started as a sophomore, and, and didn't really know to what extent, you know, comparably speaking, what it would look like versus other guys. And then so sophomore was just I was a you know bigger kid, always a baseball guy, so kind of always could throw. And then you know junior year is really when I kind of took off, um, I, you know I guess athletic if you want to say it, but but just from a quarterback standpoint, yeah, you, you know, started feeling it. Yeah, yeah, rhythm, yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, beginning of the mastery of what that sure. looks like, you know, and I, and I say mastery loosely, obviously, it's, it's something you can't master, but, um, you know, I just kind of felt myself being a little bit better than the people around me uh, or around their Metroplex, I guess. And um, so a couple of camps and stuff that I went to and, and um, anyway, so I wound up at um, a camp there in Knoxville and, and uh, Coach Fulmer um, actually pulled us aside. It was me and another kid from... Uh, um, a Houston school, um, and we just started kind of started throwing. And, uh, so he was kind of dialing it down, saying, "I'm gonna, I'm probably gonna pick one of you yeah, guys." <laughs> yeah, that's that's really what it was, that's man. Cool. It was kind of crazy, and um, you know, I guess that was my first glimpse of what pressure was. I mean, it was the whole camp. You know, we, you know, we had gone into it, I think, with a little bit of interest from you know Fulmer in Tennessee, and and then um, it was weird to be kind of like pulled out and like, "Hey, you guys are gonna throw now." Um, had a couple of the other crews that were already committed there kind of like watch us. It was, it was pretty weird. But um, yeah, so anyways, got a call, you know, that next weekend, hey, we want to offer you a, a scholarship to Tennessee, which was, which was crazy. And, uh, what kind of scholarship? Uh, it's full ride. I mean, most, most, most football schools are, are all full ride. So um, yeah, so it was, it was a really cool deal. And then that was about uh, uh, July, I guess. So they ended up playing my senior season, and then in November, um, and this was this was right when Fulmer had just signed like a seven-year extension, you know, which for recruits a big deal. I mean, yeah. you know that there's going to be some consistency there, but um, yeah. And about November, they kind of started tanking a little bit, not doing too hot, and and then found out that Fulmer was was let go, and then uh, you know Kiffin came in, and Kiffin wanted his his California quarterback, 
which was which was not okay. me. He actually Kiffin had, brought his boys. Yeah, with exactly. Him, right? He actually had me and Taj Boyd. I don't know if you remember that name from Clemson. Yeah, yeah. I yeah, know yeah. Boyd he is, was yeah. he was committed there as well, and so interesting. You know, we both kind of went off to do two pretty well um yeah. you know after that but anyways yeah so so coach montgomery who was my oc at baylor was was in the door like that next week i was like listen i really want you to come to meet coach bryles and and at that point they had this guy named robert griffin who just had a pretty good freshman yeah, year i've heard of rg3 yeah and uh and so that's what coach bryles told me which I, you know i can always respect that he was honest he was like man you know i don't really need a quarterback right now but um, you know, we like you. We'd love for you to gray shirt, you know, that kind of thing. And so uh, I went from about a 14-hour drive, you know, home to campus, going to Knoxville to, you know, an hour and a half, which cool. I ended up really enjoying. And you seem like a family guy. Yeah. So that was a big deal for you. So yeah. tell me about your support system growing up. Yeah, well, it, it was great, man. Mom and dad were always there, um, you know, very much so a part of all the sporting events, you know, and I, and I really – you know, especially going up in the ranks, you really appreciate that. You know, when there's, um, you don't have friends taking you to practice or friends' parents taking you to practice. You got mom, you know, you got dad bringing you to practice. You don't have, you're not coming home from games with other parents. Your, your mom or dad's there. And um, I just, I, I really, I didn't understand, you know, to the full extent what that really was. You take it for granted, right? We all take it for granted. Well, I, mean, I think you take it for granted because you don't understand. Like, you know, you don't, um, it's not cognizant to you, you know, what that really means. And so, um, so yeah, you know, to, to have them, you know, really pour into me, you know, from an athletic standpoint to, you know, a spiritual standpoint um, and all the above really, really meant uh, a lot yeah, growing up. School gives you a base, you know. Mm -hmm. A lot of these kids coming out are studs on the field, but, you know, outside the lines, there's just so much chaos, you know, so much uncertainty, and you have to ask how it impacts how they play yeah. and how they relate with their teammates and how they how they answer to coaches and things like that. So uh, I think people underestimate the power of a, a positive, you know, family, and if not family, that like ecosystem kind of around yeah. you. The, the culture is a, is a huge thing. Your foundation is everything, you know, and, and especially nowadays, it, it, social media is so prevalent in, yeah. in a lot of these kids' lives at a younger age. Um, you know, your identity is, is very easily caught up in what you do. So yeah. if you get followers because of who you are on the field, then you're just, it's a natural transition to feel like all you can offer is who you are on the field. Yeah, and tough, so, man. you know, the, the, what's expected of you, the expectation of you coming in and, and being a, a stud, you know, at 18 years old, which is like, if you really think about it, man, grand scheme of things, that's young, that's super young. And, um, and even, you know, in college, it's, it's still a grown man game. You know, there's not like a, you know, there's not a, a freshman game and then you go to sophomore, junior. I mean, it's, if you, if you think, you know, your coaches think you're good enough to play, I mean, you're, you're playing with guys that are 22 years old. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, so tell me about Baylor and that transition and, you know, what'd you go through as a transitioning freshman kind of into that college? Yeah, uh, that, that was interesting. You know, I, I, it, it's funny to kind of describe that because it's it's hard for me to describe who I am as a player. You know, you always want to sit here and say like, you know, you knew that you could do it, um, but that took some growth for me. Um, it, and I don't know at what point I kind of missed that or doubted that. Um, I think that you know, if you were to ask me kind of what my motivation was athletically. I think a lot of it would be this kind of perfectionist fear of failure type motivation that I think really um, that transition for, for kids is, is something that I really enjoy being around um, that, that, you know, when you leave high school and go to college because there's, there's so much growth right there um, and, it's, and it's kind of pivotal, um, especially as a young man, you know, to, to kind of really know who you are in that standpoint. And so I, I love to be able to talk to people and really um, you know, kind of hash out or iron out, you know, that's not always the best way to think of things, you know, that, that fear of failure and, and that perfectionist standpoint, um, you know, and, and letting that kind of consume who you are as a, as a person on the field. And then, you know, obviously in, in your own personal life. Um, but so, so yeah, so, so as a, as a freshman, it was kind of like a wait and see kind of thing. I was never a go getter. Like I, I think even at a young age, I, I would just kind of fell into starting because of my size, you know, and then when it got to a point where everybody kind of caught up, it was just like, man, I don't know if I can do this. And it took a long time for me to get to the point where it was like, no, I can definitely do this, you know? And, um, and then at that point it was kind of, you know, I was older, was, you know, a, a junior, I guess at that point. And then that's where I really took off, um, you know, on the field, but there was a lot. I mean, it was, 
I think the, I had an interview one time and they were talking about it was like 1400 something rather days from you know my last start in high school to my first start. Oh yeah, I think you told oh, me about yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. huge gap, yeah, right? It's, it's kind of but in your mind, it probably right, wasn't right, weird because right. you're getting so many practice reps. Yeah, and exactly, stuff. exactly. So it's it's kind of weird to hear that, you know, when it's you under center and not anybody else. And um, and I and you know we had mentioned um, before that, you know, I kind of always felt like I was ready as a sophomore, and it was um, that, so that part was was tough. But it was also a, a huge growing scale for me, um, you know, to be able to kind of sit back. Uh, and really evaluate that that point. You know, I think I grew a lot spiritually um, because I think it was kind of adversity. Yeah, yeah I mean, it was adversity, and it was it was uh, okay. If if I'm not going to play, then there's a reason I'm not playing. So let's try and be the best backup quarterback that I can possibly be. Mm-hmm. Um, and so there was a lot of growth right there. I, th- I think you know that that really helped me and kind of propelled me to to be able to take the reins as a junior and and just let it go. Yeah. It's funny because I remember going to college too, all the way across the country from where I was from. And it was a huge transition for me. I'll never forget. I was the first night I went to Pittsburgh. I'm from Seattle. Mm -hmm. First night I went to Pittsburgh, I had these huge suitcases with me because I packed my life into a bag and one of them looked like a big worm. It was like literally 10 by three or whatever. And I was dragging into this hotel because campus hadn't opened up yet, but I came early for football camp. So no other students were checking into that Pittsburgh or whatever. And so I'm I'm at this hotel and uh, I remember I was just an exhausting day of travel and all this kind of stuff. And I'm alone for the first time in my life. And I remember being in the hotel room and dude, I cried all night. (laughs) Dude, I cried all night. And I just felt like such a woman, right? But, um, but, uh, yeah, looking back, I was that was like kind of a trigger point. And even though I didn't realize now, I was so alone. Yeah. And I actually started to compromise a lot of my values um, to feel, you know, as part to feel like I was part of a community, right? To get my confidence back yeah. and things like that. I started jeopardizing really who I was to feel comfortable in some capacity. Um, and then I'm I'm suddenly around um, a bunch of really educated people. I went to a really good school, and I felt like the dumbest guy there. Yeah. Uh, and I was no longer Mr. Big Big Guy on campus on the football field either. Right, right. Um, I was the slowest and smallest linebacker. And so I remember just my ego was made. Like I look back now and I look at like all the things that happened after that. And my ego was just bashed. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I started to compromise to feel comfortable. What It sounds like you... Um, you weathered that storm. I'm sure you made mistakes along the way, but you kind of, it seems based on the way you talk about it, that you were able to recognize what you were going through and you had a support system as well. How many guys at the college level even really can't face that adversity because they're so used to being the guy? Right, like, right. have you seen that? Yeah, oh yeah. Well, and, and like I said before too, you know, social media playing that role too. I mean, these guys are crowned before they even step on campus. <laughs> you know, and so, you know, God forbid, that you know it takes him three or four years to get going or you know in 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 cases a lot where it's like hey it's not working out here well, i'm going to transfer you know and so i never had that thought coming to my head you know of, of transferring i was always going to stick it out and again that, that support system of that's really where i grew to you know and in, in being that back up to nick that i kind of felt my identity change and and that you know i kind of adopted this philosophy of like this philosophy of you know, football is what I do, but it's not who I am. Yeah. Exactly. Now, saying that is one thing. Believing it's a totally different thing. And so I've, I've definitely struggled with that. And it's hard to, you know, it's, it's hard to, you know, when you've grown up doing one thing, like I said, that that's, that's really who you are. It's like, oh, Bryce, you're the, you're the football player. You know, it, yeah. there was never like, oh, Bryce, you're Todd's son, right? Yeah, you know, it's, yeah, never, yeah. it's never one of those things. So, um, but yeah, I mean, I, I think that, that that transition is, is it's learned at different phases for, for kids. Um, but your 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 foundation, your family, your support, your culture is is who plays a major part in that. And so, if you don't have that, it's super. I mean, it, there's nothing to do but get lost in that, you know. And and that's when you do find, like you said, um, you start compromising uh, who you are as a person and who you are, you know, morally. And um, you know, it's 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 a tough road. Yeah, for sure. Um... Well, yeah, so, and then you eventually did play, <laughs> and you eventually did excel, so tell us about that. Yeah, so that, that was, I mean, we knew we had a good team. Yeah, and what, what year is this, by the way? 
13. So this is 13, yeah. and RG3 had just graduated? Yeah, he had, so he graduated in 12. 12. Okay. Nick Florence played in 12. Yeah, Florence. And then, then I came in, in 13 and, and played. And um, there was just a, there was a, a, a stirring of the pot, if you will, yeah. of like, man, we started to get some big time recruits coming in there. Coach yeah. Bryles and those guys can recruit, um, you know, your grandma to come in if she's talented enough. And, um, <laughs> And that's what we just kind of, you know, with Coach Kaz, um, who was our strength coach, and him and his staff just did an unbelievable job of, of um, really, I mean, the physical aspect was one that we felt like we could be on the field with anybody, but mentally and psychologically, it was, it was there was something ingrained in us every day. That's very interesting that you yeah. brought up your strength coach second behind your head coach and your yeah. kind of your recruiting. I mean, like, t talk about that. Well, well, I mean, you know, it, it is funny. I kind of I, I bring that up. I think obviously it's it's the captain of the ship, right? So so your captain's not going to be, you know, your first mate. Your captain's your captain, you know, and and regardless of if the first mate actually runs the ship, yeah. it's still the captain that goes down with the ship. Okay. You know what I mean? And so it, you know, it's definitely Coach Brown's ship at that point. But but Coach Cause is what made that thing run. And I think, you know, even if Coach Brown was here, he'd say the same thing. So, um, you know, but both those guys together were, you know, it was a, it was an impressive little tag team there. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, just what Coach Kaz kind of instilled in us, but it was, it was from, you know, it was a trickle down effect of what Browse instilled in those guys. I mean, to come into Waco when he did, you know, I went to, I remember, I'll never forget in 09, I went on a recruiting trip um, to Waco. We played Nebraska. Um, Nebraska's whatever, 2,500 miles from here. And there was more red in the stadium than there was green in Waco. <laughs> and I was like, man, this is wild. It was just wild, right? So, so as a coach, and, I, and that's why I think I, I love football coaches that have that ability to change a culture. And that's why I was telling you the other day, like, I'm going to run a business someday. I don't know what it's going to be. I don't know what capacity it's, it's, it's going to be in. But, but to change it, like, I just have Dude, that burning desire. You're yeah, a quarterback, it's crazy, man. though. It's, it's like I have a burning desire to change a culture. And, um, and, that's, and that's what Bryles has. He, just, he knows walking in there that I didn't come here to lose. And that's an energy that you it can't, is. it's just an energy, right? right? Yeah. It's not it's even on paper, it's right. something you feel. 100%, and, it, and it's contagious. And, yeah. and when you have that, there's nothing that can take that away. Cool, it's a lot like business, by the way. Yeah, I mean, yeah. you, you already feel that, I'm right, sure. Right, right. Yeah. And, uh, you know, so for, for him and Kaz to, to take us as a, as a young, immature, you know, in a sense, grew to no losing, more than you know, you you, you grew to know winning. Yeah, um, yeah. They changed that whole place, and uh, and so yeah. So getting back to your question, I mean, 2013, we knew we had something special. Um, we didn't know to what extent how special it was going to be, and um, and man, we just got on the field and we just, dude, we dominated people. Like it was, we ran all over them from an offensive standpoint. No one could stop us. Is there a game you remember like we are blowing these fools out and they're like ranked? Well, I think that the Oklahoma game. You know, they, they came to our place and it was it was Oklahoma, right? So it was, it, you know, to, to that point, you know, um, Griff and those, and those guys beat him in, in 12 and uh, or I guess 11 at that point. And um, and that was a big deal. But we had the tip pass. Right. I don't know if you remember that, but but um, Kendall ran from the left side. He had like a little little skinny post in there. Linebacker tipped it or maybe it was maybe it was from the other side. Anyways, linebacker tipped it, and Kendall was literally like right here with the ball and took it to the house. And it was just, it was things yeah. that we beat them, but it, it had to be like down to the wire. And then obviously, you know, Terrence Williams in the end zone, last yeah. second play was awesome. Yeah. Um, but then they came back, you know, two years later in our place, and, and we were up by like 14, I think, at half. And, but, but just, just yeah. dominating them. Do and it know. was like, dude, we've arrived. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, and I know Bros is going to hate me for saying that because he, he always said, you know, you never feel like you've ever arrived, you know, but at the same time, it was like looking down the sideline, like, dude, we're here, man. Like we ain't going nowhere, yeah. but we're definitely here. And, um, and that was, that was a point to where, um, you know, we knew that Baylor was different at that point. What was the hardest point in your college career? Yeah. I mean, I, I think obviously that the, the waiting game was pretty tough. Um, but I don't, I don't know. I think it, I think it was the, the point where I felt like, God, what do I have to do to get this? You know, when, when Nick Florence started over me, I really had no chance of a competition. Like it was, it was his. You know, um, that part was tough because because you you feel ready mentally, you feel ready physically, 
um, I'm, I'm tired of waiting on the sideline. I'm tired of watching somebody. That's the hard part about playing a quarterback is there's only one on the field. There's no like yeah. like back door you can get right. in. You know, yeah, I just need some. I just need right. some reps. Yeah. I'm like, dude, I'll hand out peanuts, but I put just me like, in a DM. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, just let me do something, yeah. you know. Besides have this dang hat on and, and headphones, you know. Um, so yeah, so that part was 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 pretty tough, but um, I think that it was like every game that we got you know, through it was like, okay, I'm one game closer. Yeah, 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 exactly, yeah. Because he's got to graduate at some point. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah, yeah, and then tell me what the high point was at Baylor. Yeah, I think that, you know, when we, we closed out Floyd Casey, it was like, I think they, a weatherman or whatever, we are playing in Texas, and, you know, Texas was known for saying some snobby comments or whatever, and, uh, yeah, exactly right. And, you know, Texas is Texas. They got, they walk into places and, and throw down an offer sheet just because, you know, and um, so we kind of took that personally. But, um, you know, to, to close out Floyd Casey, which was, you know, in, in our, in our for all intents and purposes, was nostalgic, right? I mean, it was what the greats, you know, Mike Singletary and Walter Abercrombie and all those guys played in. And, you know, to close it out with the Big 12 championship, the first one that we've won, um, and it was like freezing fog. You know, it was yeah, yeah. it was so cold. Um, you know, but but to win that game uh, to cap off, you know, obviously an unforgettable season. But then, you know, for me, a lot of of years of of waiting um, at that point to say, you know, hey, hey, ma, we did it, yeah, kind of thing. Really you know, cool, that's pretty cool. So, what were you a senior at that point or junior? That was a junior. Came out as a junior. Uh, senior, yeah. yeah, we we came back and we won it again the yeah, next yeah, yeah. year. Yeah, that's awesome, man. So tell me, let's talk about the NFL. Let's talk about the transition, right? I mean, you were you were on the Heisman radar. Yeah, yeah. Again, it, and it's funny because it was like it was just a repeating cycle, right? So it took me forever to figure out like, hey, I can play. And then you know, it was actually towards my junior year. I'm like, okay, there there might be a chance. So are you talking about high school? No, no, no. I'm talking about college. You know, of of saying, hey, I think I can go play in the league and. And I remember telling my dad when I was a kid, I was watching a Chiefs game, and uh, I was like, man, dad, I'm going I'm to play in the NFL one day. You know, that was kind of always a, a, a dream yeah, to, sure. to go play. But um, So, yeah, towards my junior year, I'm like, man, I think I could do this, you know. And, and then, um, you know, had some, there was some thoughts of like, you know, do you go now? Or, and I was like, no, I didn't wait this whole time, you know, to, to leave a team like we have right now. Yeah. Um, I want to go win a national championship. Yeah. And so, uh but yeah, and then so so you kind of get to you get the the draft process was tough and and there was a lot of um, it, it's just nothing but talk of of what you can't do. And That's got to be hard. Yeah, I mean it's it's uh, you know it's one of those things that it, it is what it is, man. Like I went to Baylor, we won two Big Twelve championships. I wasn't asked to do a whole lot, you know, except for throw the ball and and get it to those guys, and and I did that, you know. So it's like, what more do you want? Like I can't I can't do a whole lot, so. After all, I was just like, you know, the guy can't take a snap under center, he can't take a drop, he can't go through reads, all this kind of stuff. Well, you know, for me sitting back, it was like, all right, well, watch me, right? But at the same time, there was also this perfectionist in me, this fear of failure that's like, well, what if I can't do that? And, uh, internal battle going yeah, on right there, battle, for sure. And all those things are feeding the, that voice of, of failure. And that's what, you know, as a, as a, you know, spiritually becoming mature, you, you realize that, you know, nothing, doubt, um, confusion, evil, all that kind of stuff doesn't come from God. It all comes from the enemy, right? And, and so when you feed that, that internal side of you, all you're doing is, is playing the devil's game, you know, and, um, and that's part of, of us as a human, human race playing that spiritual game because it's, it's definitely a, a thing called spiritual warfare. But, um, you know, so so that rookie year it was it was um, it was just a learning game, right? It was like, man, what in the heck's going on? I'll, I'll never forget I had a practice one time, and and it, it was wild because walking into to, to the locker room and, and seeing you know Nick Mangold's locker and Brandon Marshall and Darrell Revis and these guys that you're like you kind of grew up watching, you're like, man, this is this is wild, really cool but wild. And then, um, anyways, it was during OTAs and and Revis is playing corner. On my right side, Revis Island. Revis Island. That's right. And uh, and I'll never forget. He broke up a post in the middle of the field, and I'm like, dude, how in the world did this guy get all the way over here? What coverage is that? Yeah, yeah. And that's Revis in his prime. Too. Revis in his prime when he just knows stuff, you know. And so I was. That was kind of like my, okay, I got a lot of learning to do, you know. And um, but the, but the NFL was tough, man. It was tough because it was. 
you know, at, at least, you know, when you, when you sign your letter of intent to play college, you're going to be there for, for four years, right? Or, or five kind of years. Like the, you're going to be there, right. right? Unless you choose to go somewhere else, yeah, you're going to yeah, be there. Yeah. NFL is not like that. Like, <laughs> really? your exit evaluation meeting is like, you might not be back. Yeah. You know, so it was tough because it was, um, you know, you hear a lot of things. You hear things and, and, you know, coaches say things, front office say things, and then, you know, you kind of come to find out, okay, they, they draft a kid in the second round. You know, they just told you you did a great job, you're learning a lot, you know, keep getting better, and then they draft a kid in the second round, which is, they draft them to play. You know, they don't draft a second round to sit. So, um, it, was just, it was just a weird process for me to kind of be into um, naive, I guess, in, in a stance of, of, you know, what people say is what they mean. It's not that way. It's a business, Especially man. Especially get media involved and yeah. all that crap. I mean, my gosh, that's got to be so tough for, you know, a 21-year-old kid, you know. And then, you, and then you factor in that, like, you know, we're, like context, I keep bringing us back, but, like, you have a family, man. Yeah, like, right, you know, right. like you went to Baylor. You went through a good school, you know. There's good yeah. ethics at that school, right? Uh, there's guys coming out and they go pro after their junior year and they don't have that base and these things start f flowing around and I mean it's got to impact their psyche yeah. in practice in the weight room right. like what advice would you give guys who get drafted and maybe they're in that kind of situation and everyone's in that situation because they don't draft one quarterback and they're right, like he's right. the future yeah. right it's yeah. a gamble right so what, what advice would you give guys who are in your similar situation or are about to be about to join an NFL squad, specifically within the within the frame of media talk, yeah. uh, even player banter in the locker room. Like, what what advice would you give those guys? Yeah, well, the, the cool part is is a locker room is always going to be a locker room, you know. So like, you know, whether you're in junior high and it's who has the most acts that they can spray on somebody, <laughs> or it's in college to where it's like- Just dudes being dudes, right, I mean, it's, honestly, it's, yeah. It's really what it is, so, so that part doesn't change. The media stuff gets heightened because you have guys that are literally paid to, and it's never positive, you know? It's like, it, yeah. positive doesn't sell, doesn't you sell. know? Good stuff, good stuff doesn't sell, so it's, it's the negative part. So you have to kind of, the ebb and flow of that, of you know, not reading it, understand they have a job just like you do, and just, you know, if you're honest with people and, and you're a good person, I think that people kind of take care of you on that standpoint. But, okay. but for a kid, it, man, it's, it, it really is, and, it's, and it's, it's hard to give advice because everybody's gonna have different, a, a different way that it hits them. So, so for me, my advice is like, man, you have to take it day by day, and you have to, you have to go in that place with a smile, and you have to leave with a smile because you have to realize that there's only you know 12, 1,500 people that play in the NFL, right? Of those 15, 1,500 people, there's two at most three quarterbacks on a roster, right? So you're really talking about like 90 dudes tops. You know, out of 32 teams, if my math's right, carry the four. Yeah, and uh, you know, that, that do what you do. And so you have to yeah. see that as a blessing and you have to see that as, as you, you, it's really hard to separate those two that because you want to excel, you want to be successful. That's just in our nature, not, not only as human beings, but as, as athletes, you want to excel. And so, you know, but, but to be able to, to kind of dissociate those and, and really step back and be like, dude, this is really cool. You know, you have to take that approach because yeah. you, you let it get Savory. to you and eat it. Yeah. If, if you yeah. let it eat at you, man, then, then it's not fun. And, and the, the, you know, if you take 90, 90 people out of the world that do your thing, whatever percentage that is, less than the one percent of one percent. You know, um, you had to put that in a context, man. It's just yeah, a, it's, it's a, a really you cool got to enjoy the ride. Yeah, exactly. And then a lot of guys coming out that we work with are like they don't even understand the value of who they know, and they don't understand the value of just the rooms, you know, the doors they can knock on, I should say. Yeah. And you know, those doors are opening, like. Yeah. And it's not necessarily a, you know, you've had a ton of business success or anything like that outside the league, but it's like, hey, we created a relationship. Like, you know, like, because I was in that special setting with you and we were in it together, there's kind of this camaraderie, it seems, that was forged that it doesn't matter whether you played in the NFL for 17 years, which is what, a, who has ever played in kickers? Yeah, <laughs> Maybe? Right, right, I don't know what I'm talking yeah. about. 
um, or seven months, right? There's this bond amongst former athletes, yeah. um, which is why we emphasize community so much. But it's kind of cool because one of the things we can do together is yeah. get people to realize that that was really special, man. Yeah. And like, you right. have some cool things coming on. Right. Like, you don't even know. We're gonna yeah. help you realize how cool that is. And like, we're gonna help you leverage it too. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so anyway, New York Jets. Yep. Uh, you were with the Jets for how long? Three years. Who was the starter? Uh, Ryan Fitzpatrick. Fitzy. Harvard. Fitzy, Harvard. And then, uh, and then Josh McCown was my last year. McCown, okay, yeah, that, okay, that, that lays good framework for that. Okay, and then tell me what happened with the Jets and the transition to Miami. Yeah, um, so we had, uh, you know, just drafted um, Sam Donald first round, and um, and which is which is awesome. You know, I'm, I'm super happy for the Jazz. I'm super excited about you know my time being there. But at the same time, it's like, man, we got because not only did they do that, but they went and got Teddy Bridgewater. So right now, you got Josh McCown, who's who's a start at this point. <laughs> Teddy Bridgewater. You're like, I can beat out yeah, yeah, Darnold. Yeah. Like, I can fight Darnold. But then right, they get right. Bridge, and you're like, dude. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> and you yeah. had gotten hurt, right? right? Right. So, but, you know, at the same point, they drafted the kid first round. So it's like, okay. you know, you kind of, you're, you're, you're a big man on campus at that point, right? So, but you got, you know, Josh McCown starting. You got Teddy Bridgewater somewhere backing them up, whether it's either, you know, backing them up right now or backing up Sam, whichever one. Uh, then you got Sam, and then you got Hackenberg, who was the second round, and then me. You just keep doing tricep extensions yeah, exactly. in the gym. You're just like, I'm going to get in shape. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah, two plus two is not fish, so I need to get out of here. Um, and so, you know, it was, it was a tough decision because it was one of those things that I think I went to a couple of people to ask advice, you know. And, and the hard part was I got a, a couple of different answers. You know, there was a couple of guys that were like, dude, you need to go and ask to get released. You need to get released now. That way you have OTAs to get with a, a, a team, get, you know, used to, to the culture there, the system. You come back and, and you fight for a spot in training camp. And then you had a couple of people that were like, dude, wait it out. They haven't cut you yet. So tell me, tell me you don't have to drop names. Names, yeah. But tell me some of the guys you went to for advice. Yeah, so so Josh McCann was 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 okay. one of them. Yeah, Fitz He's was been one in of that them. Situation before. Right, yeah. right, right. Fitz was one of them, and um, and then obviously I went and talked to, to Coach Bowles as well. And, and so there was just a couple of people around there that I you know really respected it. So all this, all these. So you want an answer, and you're getting right. all these different perspectives. Yeah. And this is your first bout with the NFL. Right, right, yeah. Right. So yeah. so yeah. what yeah. happened? Uh, yeah, that was. The What's your age? Is your agent helping you at any of this? Yeah, I mean, my agent, I think we both kind of knew what, what the writing on the wall was. It was just a matter of like, do you want to put it in your hands or do you want to let them, you know, do okay. it? And so uh, I was like, man, I, I think I want to just go up and have a conversation. And, and so, you know, Mike McCagney was our GM and, and, and I really appreciate Mike for being honest. You know, it was like, hey, this is, this is what it is. You know, I, I think we... Um, we want to do right by you, you know, and I, I think we, the, to, to go ahead and release you is the best thing. And so, you know, at that point, then there's then there's 24 hour wa waiver wire. So that's, that means that you've got a full day basically to where they go down the draft order again. So the order of the draft, it's basically like a name pops up, you know, whatever it's, it's a call or an inbox DM. I don't know what it is, but it's, it's something that we're <laughs> Tweet. Yeah, exactly. Something to where it says, Hey, Bryce is available. Do you want him? Yes, no pass, whatever. Okay. And so, you know, we got the call the next day. Um, it was a long waiting, uh, waiting day there, but got you the call we? the next day, huh? You say we got the call? Yeah, we got the call. Me and my wife got the call that it. Was I was getting so I kind of want to weave Jordan into this. So yeah. when when did you meet Jordan and all this? Yeah, so so we met um, at a wedding actually. Um, I was singing at the wedding and and she was uh, catering. That's not the story. <laughs> That's not the story, bro. Yeah, so so my best my best friend was was Eddie Lackey. He was a linebacker for us at Baylor, and and his wife and my wife grew up in the same town. And so okay. I was kind of the you know between me and Links Hawthorne. I say that I'm the best man. Link says he is. It's really Eddie's fault for not designating a, a, a best tell. man. Yeah, Time will tell. very true. Time will tell. <laughs> and Links isn't in the country. He's in Italy with Coach Brown. So oh, I, I, I have yeah, exactly. So I'm saying I'm the best man. But um, yeah, so my so my wife sang at the wedding, and and I always like to tell people I saw red dress and legs and and some vocal cords and was done. And some vocal cords, right? But tell, I love the story because it 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 taught me a lot about you. Yeah. So. You made a move. Yeah, yeah. We're, um, you know, we were kind of sitting outside, and and it was funny because all the all the the uh, groomsmen, I guess, were like, "Dude, who's chick in the red dress?" Like it was <laughs> it was a thing, you know, with the, amongst the single guys, of course. Yeah, of course. Um, yeah, only appropriate. Right. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. And um, 
And so uh, I actually ended up waiting around. I was I was kind of talking to to Eddie and and uh, his sister, and then they have. Uh, his sister has a little boy named TJ, and, and so I was kind of hanging out with TJ. But I had a uh, there was an intention of hanging out with TJ, and it, and unfortunately, it wasn't to hang out with it TJ. It was strategic. It was strategic, and so I was like, okay, I, we couldn't ever tell if she was with one of the band members. She was kind of sitting off by herself, and um, and then all of a sudden, she got up to sing, and I was like, well, I gotta I gotta hear her sing. And uh, it was at that point that I knew, you know, tractor beam, and um, yeah. So that was the icing on the cake. So you're like, she looks good, and then you add the vocal cords. No, I th her personality first. You know, I'm, I'm a personality guy. I know that you're a looks guy first, but um, I'm, uh, it was, uh, I, yeah, she looks really good. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, that's a compliment to my beautiful <laughs> wife. You know, thank you very much. I appreciate that. I'll take it, man. I'll take it. You, on the other hand, was probably more personality uh, than oh, looks. Yeah, yeah. yeah. right, that's right. It. That's it. Um, but yeah, so so I ended up hanging out in the hall, and then uh, you know she came out, and I said, "Hey, are you ready? You know, for a duet?" And she said, "A duet," and I was like, "Yeah, I think we're singing together." Um, it was my little uh, crack at a joke, but for me, it was just it was an icebreaker. You know, <laughs> yeah, that's all I needed. Um, and so then we ended up going to. Um, I guess a rehearsal dinner and and ended up again strategically getting in line. I actually went when the women went, you know, it was like, hey ladies, you know, you guys go get <laughs> and so I somehow meandered up there, you know, with Jordan and, and it was, you know, one of the buffet styles. So I was on one side and she was on the other and um, I was judging the fact that she was getting, you know, hummus and uh, lettuce and, you know, a tomato. For, yeah, to, for it was like e. a rabbit meal. Yeah, and I was like, all right, this girl. Um, but then, you know, we had a great conversation for the, the you know, 28 seconds in the buffet line. And then, uh, and then I, I let her have her piece, man. You got to feel out the defense. Yeah. Well, I, you know what? It was almost like letting other guys be fools. Which lays a nice contrast for when you re-arrive. Very true. And that's the whole thing. So, so I knew at some point, you know, the other guys were going to fumble on themselves. Is that the Baylor mental training that your strength coach put you through? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and yeah, um, that's yeah. cool, man. So you, you and Jordan, I've, I've noticed from, I mean, not even noticed, but I mean, I've known from the minute we had our first conversation and then now getting to know her that it's a huge part of your life, man. It's a big priority for you. So it's cool that you had her to kind of go all, go through all of this to, you know, with. Yeah, right, right. Yeah. Um, no, she's been huge, man. And I'm not saying that just because she's standing right behind you, but. How many photos do you think she's taken? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, probably quite a bit. Um, Guess on the hashtags on that. Yeah, I know. That's why I can't say the way we actually met. But um, we. Uh, <laughs> I'm just kidding. This is all a yeah, facade. We practiced this. Right. <laughs> You're doing great. Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, yeah, we swiped right and then. Uh, <laughs> But no, I mean, in, in all seriousness, you got to have, um, there's a lot of times in life and it, it's not just because you're a football player, it can be anything, you know, and, and, and you know, in, in corporate world or, um, you know, as, as a coach and as a car salesman or whatever, life's going to throw curveballs at you and, and your foundation that you grew up with, you know, your family, you know, whatever that dynamic is, is, is going to immediately translate into how you approach your significant other. And so... Um, it, but at the same time, how you translate that, but uh, or, or transition to that, but it's also, um, you know, you had mom and dad kind of be your backbone, and now you have a wife that's your backbone. And um, so to go through things, um, you know, especially that we did, it May was tough, you know, and um, it was, uh, it, and, and really the, the preceding months were, were pretty tough. So it ended up being a, a tough little four month stretch for us. But um, I think we've grown a lot from that. So you bought, you bought property and uh, there's a wolf outside. Uh, this is how we do it. Uh, <laughs> do you have a trained wolf outside? Um, normal, normal X NFL, yeah. classic X NFL. Uh, no, so you, <laughs> uh, so I totally lost my train of thought. I'm thinking about werewolves now. Um, no, but uh, so you guys bought, did you buy a place in New York? No, when you, when no, you we lived, always okay, rented. Okay, you were yeah. renting, so that's, we were that's good. That was smart. So, and then you, Thank you. transitioned. <laughs> I didn't mean it like that, but yeah, <laughs> smart move. Uh, so you transitioned down to, uh, to Miami. Yeah. So tell me how the Dolphins transitioned. Who was the head coach at that point? 
Adam Gase, That's who's Gase, now, right? yeah. yeah. Tell me about that transition to Miami. Yeah, um, so the, the, the thing that was tough, I think, about Miami was that we felt like it was God saying, hey, here's a new leaf. You know, we're, we're turning a new leaf. There's, there's, Which is nice. Right, right. right. Yeah. You know, you have that expectation, that hope, right, that, um, hey, this was part of the plan. There's, yeah. there's always something uh, bigger to whatever situation you're in. The weather's better, too. The weather's a lot better. It's a lot hotter. Um, but I think, the, I think the tough part about Miami w was that, that we had the expectation that it was different. Um, that we had the expectation that, um, you know, for, for us, this is what we needed. This was the change that we needed. And, uh, you know, Coach Gase being an offensive coach and being there and, you know, you kind of learn under Tannehill for a little bit. And, and um, But anyways, it just, it was tough, man. It was tough because I think that, you know, whether expectation, you know, played into that and expectation versus reality, you know, you always kind of hear that. But um, it, was just a, it was just a different dynamic from the locker room standpoint, from, you know, the, the city itself, and then, uh, you know, the quarterback room as well. And those, those guys are great, man. I mean, between Ryan, David, and Brock, um, they, were, they were good dudes. It was just, it was just a diff different dynamic for me. And um, I think, you know, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I just, I think it was my first time to ever have spiritual warfare, in, in a sense. Yeah, I mean, we, we're, we're open with one another about our Christian faith, yeah. right? We feel like it's um, adversity draws us closer to God. Tell me about Miami, man. I mean, as much as you're willing to share. Yeah, no, no, no. I mean, I, I, I want to be open and organic about it because it's, it, it really is. It's, there's a lot of things that people go through that people try to harbor, and I, and I don't think that that's, I don't think that's why we go through things. I think we go through things to be written about. You know, in the other case, we wouldn't have the Bible. You know, we wouldn't have the Old Testament if it wasn't supposed to be written about. Not, not the hardship itself, but what God does through it. Yeah, you know the what I'm saying? Right, it, right, story. right. Yeah. And that's and that's what we pull from as as humans now going through life. Um, we look back on those stories, you know, of, of David and Lot and Jonah, and you know, I mean, no, all the the, the list goes on of of things and and people that. So spiritually, for me, it was tough. Um, because I'm naturally an upbeat person. You can't hide your faith. You're like me. Yeah, we we can't I, I not know, talk it's, about it's it. It's true, man. And and I and I love that. I think I think that's there's there's something to be said about that. That um, it's who we are. You know, it's it's God is God is you know woven into our DNA, and I think that's awesome. So the first conversation we had, we're like, dude, I think God's doing something here because yeah. we clicked like that. It was right, crazy. Right, it was like right. weird. Yeah, and 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 I've always been drawn to people that that are like that. You know, that 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 can. Um, that can talk about faith organically and it's not something that's just on Sundays and it's not something that's at a Bible study or a community group, you know? Um, but I, I don't know, man. I, I know that there's, there was that, that season in our life happened for a reason and, and, and I know I say that a lot, but um, I think it taught us a lot. I think it taught us a lot about, you know, who we are as a couple. It probably drew you, drew you much closer. Yeah. And, it, and that's what I like to say, man. We, 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 we grew together towards Christ and yeah. and and I was telling you know we were we had date night the other night and and talking about you know there's definitely there's one or two ways you go about situations you know you either get closer to God or you, you run away you know and and I'd like to say that you know we kind of grew closer to God through that and cool. um, so yeah we're, there's gonna be something that happens and you know whether it's two months two weeks two years whatever down the road that we're gonna be like that's that's yeah. what Miami happened and you just don't get it yet and that's yeah. cool but Man, I, I love that you have that perspective on things, always seeing that it's in some capacity at some point in time, there's this serendipitous nature of the things. God, that's a great word. Good for you. Great, by the way, great movie. Cusack's my guy. Uh, can you spell that? Um, we're going to move on from that question. <laughs> um, but, <laughs> played the fifth. Um, but, but it's cool that, you know, you're going to see that thing come full circle. We've gone through a lot of adversity as a couple as well. Um, Everything contributes to your journey. Everything contributes to your ability to mentor others, to yeah, serve others. Right. So you have to look at things like that, yeah. right? Um, cool, man. So Miami happens. Uh, one of our first conversations was like, you were like, yo, it's, it challenged my faith a little bit. Not challenged my faith, but it, it, it tested my faith. Yeah. It was a dark place. Right. Um, so when, was, when did you reach the point where you were like, all right, like, and it might have been recently, and you might not even be there because yeah. you're still in shape. You look great. Um, these beers are not helping. That's true. Um, but That's true. when was the point where you were like, I might be done playing in the NFL. I might be playing, done playing football. Yeah. Um, 
I don't, I don't know, man. It's, it's kind of weird. I think it's just kind of, it's, um, it's happened over time. It's been a process. I don't think that was a singular moment that I was like, yeah. I'm done. I think that it was just, um, you know, so, so Miami happened. I ended up tearing my oblique in, in September and uh, grew some injury. I'm super tough. And um, <laughs> <laughs> we ended up, um, yeah, just a freak deal. It's so stupid. I never, I never have soft, yeah, I never have soft tissue injuries, you know, and, and, um, but anyways, so uh, strangely enough, I kind of got on this, on this thing of, of kind of wanting to get my mind on something else other than football. And so I started looking at real estate um, and, and to what capacity, like what can I do in real what, estate? What, why? I don't know. I don't know. I did, well, to, to be honest, it was uh, one of those, one of those crowdfunding sites came up on my, on my, okay. uh, in my email and I was like, this is kind of cool. I kind of want to get into it. I like it. You can see it, touch it, feel it. I kind of got to the point about the last year and a half where I started to realize like, hey, I can make my money work for me, you know? And it, yeah, yeah. Cliche. Plus it's not it like you're an idiot money. with a terrible personality. I mean, like right, you, right, you, right. Get, you get this stuff. Yeah. Right. Um, <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> you're not an idiot. It's a, with a terrible personality. <laughs> <laughs> very true, very true. Uh, I'm yeah. just, no, but, but what I'm really saying there is there's this perception, and it's somewhat true, that athletes really just, they get done and they're like, real estate. Right. Or like VC, right, you know? Right, right. And, uh, but it seems like your interest was more organic. Yeah, yeah. Well, it, it was, it's, you got to have something that interests you, right? Obviously. But then you also have something I feel like that, that what I love about it is, is I don't think, just like football, you can play it as as long as Tom Brady's played it, and I and I assume that he still watches film because there's something that he missed last Tom's year. Tom's watching this, right? Yeah, <laughs> dang right. Talk about film, dang bro. right he is. <laughs> um, but but you know I think real estate kind of has that component that it's always changing. There, you're never going to get to a point where you know everything about real estate, and I think if you do, cool. you're probably you know you don't need to be in the same. Because every client is like a new defense. You got to figure out their oh. patterns and all that. Ooh, analogy drop. Whoa. Uh, now, no, but really though, we talked to a ex WNBA player in Dallas, and um, she said the exact same thing. She's like, every day is an adventure, and for her, it's not really about the money. I mean, she likes the commercial side; she likes yeah. the money can grow. Right. But she's like, I use my personality, and like every day is different. Yeah. I have yeah. I have to adapt, just like I did on the court. Right. And that's I think that athletes, and it doesn't matter whether you played in high school, it or or you played in the NFL. It's like a mentality, and. Um, there's a certain psyche that comes with being a successful athlete, especially in leadership positions on the field, quarterback, linebacker, right? Where you have this killer mentality and you like to manage a lot yeah, of complexity, right, right, right. right? And I mean, you talk about a complex world with all these ever-changing factors, real estate, yeah. I mean, right? But the huge upside as well, um, the touchdown, right? So yeah. so anyway, I, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna stop stealing the show, but, um, but I, I wanna hear, about AMR, I want to hear about the decision-making process up to that. Um, maybe some mistakes you made in your transition. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, it, it was kind of one of those things that, hey, this is what's interesting to me, and I can I kind of had a, a checklist of, of things as I as I got back. You know, so we we left in October. We were on IR for a couple of weeks, got let go, stayed, rehabbed a little bit, and then came back. And throughout that whole time, it was like, who do I know that's in real estate? And it kind of, it was a little bit. Um, you know, craziness of how many people that I knew that were actually in real estate. So I just became a yes man. I was like, if, well, yeah. if I can set up this meeting or if you want to have coffee, I'm there. Yeah, beggars can't be choosers, right? right? Exactly. But, but realistically, though, from a business guy's standpoint, they were trying to sell you. Yeah. There was a lot of sales going on. So did you reach out to like, because you have a brand, especially in Texas. Yeah. So like NFL, did you reach out to former NFL guys? About, about real about estate. Like, did you reach out to like Staubach and those guys? Uh, well, yeah, he's, that's like, did you get in touch with the president? You know, those guys are, are pretty good. Someone asked me the other day, like, have you run this by Roger Staubach? I'm like, oh no, I won't text him back. You know, like, come on, man. Like, <laughs> not yet. It's a little tough. It's a little tough. Secret service and all that kind of stuff. But, um, no, I, n I never really talked to other, other football players about that. And it's kind of funny, man. It's kind of, um, it's a, um, I don't want to say it's an unspoken word, but it's it's just like no one really knows what you do off the field, you know, unless you're outwardly speaking about it, you know, from from business venture standpoint, which I think is kind of a complex that needs to change. That's because what we're trying to do, man. That was your plug, um, and so and so I think that from an athlete standpoint, 
unfortunately you are pitched a ton of things, hardly any of those things are actually for your benefit, right? It's always for someone else's benefit. Because you have money, this will benefit me. This bar, this club, uh, this restaurant, whichever, those are my, my three main food groups that you know, you're always told it's to, to stay away from. But, um, but it's, it was a realization for me as I kind of started to get older and, and to understand finances that, hey man, th there's an opportunity here that, um, you know, to take kind of the gifts and talents that God's given me. I've been blessed financially through that. Um, but to be diligent about like, you know, where, where we go with that. But I wanted to do something outside. If it just sits in your bank account, it's doing nothing but going down, right? So, okay. So catch you back up now. So, so this, this whole real estate thing started uh, when I got back in, in November. And I just started talking as, to as many people as I could. And, and I, I didn't need to correct you though, because there wasn't, everybody was very genuine. I, I felt okay. like anyways, okay. and, I, and I might be wrong. But, okay. but as far as me saying, hey, I don't know anything about real estate other than how to spell it. I don't, so, so what exactly do you do? Okay, great. Oh, you're in retail. Nice. Oh, okay. You're in development. Nice. That's a, that's, that's actually cool. Cause so like a lot of people do a lot of research online when they're trying to figure that kind of stuff out. Right. But I think we're similar in that we need to talk to people. Yeah. Like I'm not going to sit on my laptop for six hours. Right. I need to just go get out there and yeah. be like, okay, this connects to this. Can I, right, right, yeah, right. yeah. So you did a good job of that. It seems cause you seem to have a comprehensive view of the market yeah, and stuff. Yeah, yeah. So like when we were, you know, doing math as a kid, like you put me on in, in a book and piece of paper and I couldn't do it. But if dad has, you know, peas and it's like, okay, I have two peas here two piece here that's four and i was like oh okay great yeah yeah you know visual. so it was like yeah, yeah, you know yeah. it was it was it's that it's it's you know i can read it in a book i don't understand it but if you explain it to me then typically i'm going to get it in that in that sense and so um and so that's really how that started and then i had a buddy his name summit hoag who um is, is a good friend of mine we do bible studies Summit's together cool. yeah and um i funny how i connected you to him one day and you're like yeah summit's my <laughs> yeah. boy dude like i'm like I don't dude need this, this is the connection. Worst connection ever yeah. Doesn't get anything done. That's a done. net zero connection. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I didn't want a beer. I needed advice. <laughs> yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. uh, no offense to Summit, but um, yeah. And so and so, I, I felt like I needed the, my my wedge or or way to get into real estate was to 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 buy into real estate. Right. Um, I had a couple opportunities that there was a pad site here and there to to get into, and I'm like, is this what I need to do? And and then again, it was just really just through God's grace, it was. Hey, this guy, you know, I talked to, to Larry Burnett, who's the, um, the EDC or on the EDC committee at, in, in Baylor, so in what Baylor, is that? Sorry. uh, economic development yeah, committee. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. people might not know that. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. 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 Yeah. Um, so, so every city has one of those that's, that's sole purpose is to how can we economically develop our community? Right. Yeah. And so, you know, and talking to him, he was like, hey, you need to talk to, to this person. And, and this, so he gave me a couple of people, um, you know, that, that ended up uh, being, being a big help into, um, you know, how I can grow. And so this guy's name is John Weber Jr. And so his, his dad um, and him do the, the super targets around this, this target that's right here in Colleyville, they developed that. Um, so anyways, through his expertise in, in you know, real estate and, and, and all that kind of stuff, and I'll, and I'll land the plane here in a second, but um, it was always, it was just one meeting after another of trying to understand what you do, why you're successful, and what I should do. So he became a business mentor for you. Uh, yeah, yeah, he really did, man. Especially that at that young stage, and That's so yeah, and so so what I figured out was, hey, I don't need to 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 do an investment deal. So why did you decide to not do an investment deal? John was uh, was kind of paramount in that decision of of you got to know. So he, he brought me by this pad side, right? And it's it's, it's actually kind of cool. And I'm, I'm I'm sure people have already turned the podcast off at this point because they're like bored. But I love it. So so when you look at a at a at a pad side, right, or development, you need to drive by it at eight o'clock. 11 o'clock, 1 o'clock, 3 o'clock, 5 o'clock. Who's there? Is it accessible? Is it easy to get to? What's beside it? Where's the traffic at? And all that kind of stuff, like you don't really think about, you know, when you're in the car, you're listening to Shania Twain or whatever, or, you know, whatever you're listening to. And no, no, nail on the head on that one. <laughs> <laughs> She's gorgeous, man. I don't know. Yeah, I don't, um, Let's and, carry uh, on. Yeah. And, uh, but you don't ever think about that stuff, but it's also because like, like we were talking about earlier, I don't know, business stuff, you know, business stuff, things that are super easy to you because you've been doing the last 10 years are like monumental to me. We figure it out. Right. We exactly. Yeah. Out. I don't know. So, um, 
but anyways, yeah, it's, it was like little things like that that just kind of helped me, hey, I don't need to do that. And um, so anyways, it kind of brought me to, you know, this meeting with, with the managing partner at AMR uh, Capital. His name's Rush Graves. And so we were talking and he's like, listen, man, you can get into, you know, some of the stuff we got if you want, but I think you'd be really good at this. So tell me what you do and tell me, so to simplify it, right? So tell me what Tell me what you guys do and what you do. Right, right, right. So, so at AMR Capital, um, right, we're we are raising funds for our hedge fund. Raising funds, being raising capital, raising money for our hedge fund. Um, Rush, through his expertise and background, has been multifamily. So, the thing that you'll kind of find um, when you talk to most people about real estate is that you want to have a niche and you want to be really good at that niche. Yeah, pick a niche. Right. Don't don't be, you know, a master of all or yeah. you know yeah, you can't whatever, cater whatever to what that saying is. Yeah, 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 I, I can't remember what that saying is, you know, really good at everything, master at none. Everything whatever. to everybody or whatever. Right. Yeah, yeah. So so you wanna have a niche, you wanna be really good at that niche. And then if you get to that point you wanna surround yourself with other people that are really good at that niche. So um, so that's his niche, multifamily. So, you know, he created a, a monopoly of sorts, as I, I like to consider it, where he had the management company that would come in, manage the property. He had the construction company that would come in and do the, the renovations. Yep. And then, um, you know, through his fam family and friends around him, um, he had the equity to go in and buy these places. So yep. I would say that it was, it was in all, in all, for all extents and purposes, it was a monopoly. Like he had cash coming from everywhere, right? Um, I owned about 2,400, 2,700 units. Um, as uh, either himself or partnered in, which if you talk to people for one single person, that's, that's a lot of doors, it's a lot of units. And uh, so, so very successful. Ended up, uh, you know, selling those the last couple of years. And um, and now it's kind of come back on the private equity side of okay. things. Okay. So it if you- be a finance Right, yeah, exactly. Well, if you think about it, man, the, the, when you manage properties, it, it can be a headache sometimes because you're just dealing with, yeah. a, lot, you're yeah. dealing with a lot of things. I mean, people suck. Right, <laughs> right. <laughs> you're dealing with a lot of things. And, and a lot of the times it's, it's you find these value-add properties that are really good um, that just need a little bit of TLC right it's it's and a lot of times it's not the people in the tenants or, or the people as the tenants that make a property bad it's it's the it's the people that manage those people yeah. you know and, and the thing is is if you if you treat people like people things run smoothly you're gonna have a toilet break every now and then you're gonna have a pipe bust but all in all, things things typically run smoothly. So so that's what we do. Is is he will on a Monday to Friday basis have deals come in, deals being projects, deals being being properties that come across his desk. And so his job is to vet those deals. They're from a you know certain list of criteria that you know we want to make our numbers work so that our you being our investor are happy, right? And so that's kind of what we do on a day-to-day -day basis is, is go out and find, you know, typically value-add properties um, that, that we provide the LP or the, the equity into. Um, these are bankable sponsors. These are guys that have already been vetted by banks and all they need is an equity component, typically 20 to 30%. Price, price, price. So like to, to reel it back a little bit, because okay. we're talking about business at this point. Mm -hmm. You talk like a business dude. So, and you've only been doing this for like a year and a half, you said? Uh, since January. So, dude, that's ridiculous. Like, you have a crazy mind. Like, I want you... No, 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 I mean, you're crazy. <laughs> no, 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 no. I mean, like, I'm very impressed with you. Um, because, and I've, I've told this to my wife, like, every time I talk about you, I'm like, he's not, like, this guy's very intelligent. And he's personable, and he's hilarious, and he quotes Jim Carrey, which is a guy. <laughs> yeah. So, like, obviously, So, bro, we just become best friends? Um, so, like, we're... we're <laughs> We're hanging out on very, you know, immature uh, grounds. Uh, no, but realistically, man, like, went to Carnegie Mellon University, was around really smart people. It's a finance and engineering school. It's a technology school. I was the dumbest guy there. Went and worked in, at PwC for 10 years or whatever. Came into entrepreneurship. Now I'm in the VC space. You talk venture capital. You talk real estate investment like someone who's been in the industry for at least five years who has a really solid business background. I'm really impressed by you, dude. Like seriously, I want you to know. Thanks, that. man. I want you to know that. I, I'm very humbled by like just you, when you're talking business and for you to rattle it off like it's no big deal. It's like whoa, like half the people listening are like WTF? What's he talking about? So um, that was so I bad. Think, well, <laughs> that was so. <laughs> there are, did, did we just have like a Mean Girls excerpt here? Like, did Lindsay Lohan just come out of the wall and like WTF?
Can I, can I put the middle finger in the air in this house? <laughs> it's my house. You can't do that. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I will not disrespect. But what I'm really saying is um, I think you're the, one of the reasons I wanted to sit down with you is because you crush the stereotype that is blanketed on a lot of athletes, especially transitioning athletes in VC. Um, Dallas Startup Week is coming up. Dallas Startup Week is kind of this, um, this eclectic affair that brings a lot of startups together with investors and all these kind of things. They run a, there's different tracks. Marketing is a track. Finance is a track. Um, we originally, we recently ri uh, pitched a concept to the head of Startup Week and uh, the commentary was, you know, yeah, okay, you want to talk about athletes and you want to talk about startups and investments and stuff like that. That's marketing. And we pushed back and said, no, it's really not. Like these guys, not every one of them, but these guys understand deals. They want to understand deals. And like, here's the reality of it. Athletes don't want to just be categorized as venture capitalists slash angel investors when they transition. Yeah. Oh, you have money. Put it into my deal. Right. That's what their cousins are doing. Right. They're approaching them on, hey, I got a barber shop. I need 50K, right? They want to come in as integral partners who are driving the business's growth like you are with AMR now, not just as a connector, but someone who really knows the business and someone who can like talk numbers and stuff like that. And of course, you're going to learn it more and more and more over time. And you can't get into the deep financials yet and stuff like that. There's concepts you just haven't fully understood right. yet. But your brain, I mean, my God, in the context of like an average internship for a college guy, you're, I would hire you full time because you're clearly grasping it. You get it. You have a passion for it. Um, so anyway, I, I've spoken enough on that, but you get my point. Yeah. Uh, no, well, Trust thank you. you thank Trust you. Thank you. you. Well, I think it, it goes to, you don't know what you don't know. Right. And so, but it go, again, when you, when you're passionate about something, when you wake up and have purpose to something, you're just naturally going to, through osmosis, learn a lot more than, you know, if you're, if you really don't want to be in English class, you're probably not going to do well in English or class. Or if it's a check a box, you can or go play running back. Right, 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 right. Yeah, you know, exactly. like... We all, all of us in elementary school that want to do school, we want to go play kickball, right? But so it's the same thing, man. It's, it's, there is a stereotype that, that gets around athletes a lot of times because everybody just sloughs us off as that they don't know. Well, how are we supposed to know when, when football is our job? You know, that's what we do. That's what we do know, right? Like you, I put a board in front of my face, I'll draw you cover two pretty quick, you know? And, and it's those kind of things that, that as you get into the business world, the corporate world, you're going to pick up just like you pick up football, but you have to be given a chance. And you have to be going after something that you're passionate about. Very true. Passionate. Are you as passionate about real estate finance as you were about football? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think that I, there's also something that, that just comes very natural with, with real estate to, to a degree in, in me writing notes. I, I think that when you're exposed to something very early and given a, a, a lot, you, you begin to pick up pieces because it's kind of trial by error, trial by fire, right? Like knowing that I have to go into a meeting with a family office, I got right. So... Like I need to, I need to know what the hell I'm talking about, or else I'm gonna be like thrown to the wolves. Yeah, for sure. There's this like echelon that you're right, expect. Right. I mean, and and that pressure. I mean, to be cliche, it makes diamonds. Like right, right. you prepare for that meeting. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Another thing is, it's a rhetoric, right? It's a, it's a conversation. When you have one rep and then you don't do anything for five minutes, and then you have another rep and then you don't do anything for five minutes, and then you go get in a board and watch film for two hours, like. Is it, is it actually learning? Yeah. Whereas if you're thrown into a meeting and you talk, you know, you respond, I listen, then I talk, and, it, and there's a conversation yeah, that goes yeah, on yeah, about yeah. business. It's got to be dynamic. Yeah, like yeah, it just, yeah. just kind of happens, man. It's yeah. like, you know, it's, it's like a forest fire. It's going to engulf a lot of things, but at the yeah. same time, like it's going to move. Yeah. But like if yeah. you just sit there, it's just like, uh, That's cool. That's you know, yeah, my arm got tired, <laughs> you know, like brain slows down a little bit, yeah. you know, You're like when's lunch? Um, so I'm going to, I have one more thing. We've talked for a while, but I'm going to, I have one more question. So I was talking to this former cowboy guy and he was like, he was learning all about what we're doing. And he's like, your biggest issue is that athletes expect black and white. Cause that's how football is right. and, and sports are. And they, they expect black and white in a very gray world. 
What would you say? What would you say to that? Um, again, I think it depends on the athlete. I think that you, when you stereotype something, it's it's like, you know, getting as a bully and a kid um, back in like middle school or whatever. When you get called dumb every day, what do you start to believe? You're dumb. Right. So if you if you're gonna tell me that that hey athletes are are you know need black and white in a gray world, what are we gonna believe that it is black and white in a gray world? So. So what you are exposed to before you even get into that space is what you're going to perceive. So I don't think, I'm not sitting here saying that, you know, you got to have the CEO go and talk, you know, numbers and, and terms that, you know, you don't know. But at the same time, that just, just in the sense of, of me being able to talk to you, I didn't know any of this two months ago. All of this is questions and research that I've done and you know, Rush being awesome uh, as far as helping me out with all that stuff. But it's but it's also it's not being spoon fed. No, nothing in the world is is achieved by being spoon fed. Besides when you're a baby and grow, right? But like at the at the same time, there's a component to growth there that you're either gonna want to do it or not. The guys that want to be spoon fed are probably not gonna be CEOs of Fortune 500 companies. Just like the guys that that don't want to and have a desire and passion to be more than a football player are probably the ones that are going to be CEOs of Fortune 500 companies and be very successful, just like they were on the field or off the field or whatever the case is. But you can't you can't sit there and 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 just characterize the whole um, just because you know, hey, we've done football our whole life, so we don't have capacity to grow. Yeah, absolutely. We have a color wheel. We just gotta we just gotta dive into it. Yeah, for sure. Cool, man. I mean, you're the embodiment of just a lot of characteristics that, I mean, we believe are instrumental in that transition being smooth, right? You have the humility, you have the faith, you know, not everyone has to have faith, but it does help you. Um, you have the relationships, you have the drive, you, I mean, you have, you have the personality. And so um, it's, it's been really cool talking to you, man. Well, I appreciate the opportunity, dude. I really do. No, it's been fun getting to know you, man. And uh, so we're going to wrap this up, but uh, this was really fun. And uh, I don't know. I mean, I guess I would say expect more of this kind of thing. That's right. That's right. Um, but yeah, we're excited about talking about athletes' transitions and what they learn through their, their difficult seasons and, uh, and how they apply it in business when they do transition. So thank you very much.